Yeah, shoot your hands in this morning. Get your hands. This is what you got to do. I had another fatigue day during the week. Feel good today. Feel good. All right. I saw her. I talked to her on the phone. She said, we're going to go around. Wait, I know that you have a coach from Denver, James, and you reached them to death. So I was told that she's there on Sunday. I think the reason I'm saying that. Great. It is. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for that reply back. That is our secret language here at Pinnacle. I say good morning. And you interpret that to mean it's time to find a seat. Come on in and find a seat. We're glad to see everyone here today. Excited about the um, changes that are taking place. We look outside and we see um, blue skies and lots of sunshine. Almost as much sunshine as there is conversation in here. But we take that as a good sign. We know that there's lots of fellowship and lots of love uh, among the brothers and the sisters. And that's just fine uh, with us. But we do want you to know that uh, here at the Pinnacle Church of Christ, we are living and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, part of that is in the fellowship that we enjoy one with the other. But the main part of that is when we open uh, God's word and begin to share uh, the truth of his word. And that's what we're here to do today, to worship him in spirit and in truth. So glad that so many of you are joining uh, in with us in doing that. If you're here visiting this morning, we want you to know that you are our honored and welcome guest. That's, that's some of the, the chatter that you hear going on. It's just welcoming and fellowshipping with one another. But we're going to ask that you do us a favor. In the seat back in front of you, there is a, um, a little QR code. If you'll scan that with your smartphone, it'll take you to a place where you can enter in your information. Um, if you're a member, scan it anyway, and that'll be a record of your attendance. Uh, an even easier way to do that, though, if you're not familiar with the QR code, is just to uh, send us a text message to that number that is up on the screen. Uh, give us your information, uh, and we'll be so pleased to get that. And we ask that you do that for no other reason uh, than to let you know that we appreciate you, that we're glad that God has sent you our way, and we want to adequately acknowledge uh, your presence here today. If you're looking for a church home, uh, we want you to do like so many of your other brothers and sisters have done and let it be known uh, that you desire to place membership here. One of our elders, uh, myself, Chuck, uh, we'll be happy to talk to you about the Pinnacle Church of Christ. But we want you to know that there's a place for you here at Pinnacle. And so if you're looking for a church home, we like to say your search has ended. Uh, we would be delighted to have you to roll up your sleeves and to uh, work with us as we try to make a difference for good for the Lord uh, here in this in this area. I want to say a quick welcome to those that are joining us via the live stream. We live stream our services out uh, on Facebook as well as YouTube. And uh, an easy way to get to that, if you'll go to our church website, uh, you can choose whichever of those two platforms that, that you uh, like best. And there's a link that'll take you directly there. And speaking of our church website, you'll find tons of information there. Uh, all of our online content is archived there. We put that content out there with this in mind, and that is to help you to grow uh, in your walk with the Lord. Uh, there's something there that will help you. If you miss uh, one of the services and you need to go back and, and re-listen to that or replay it, it's archived there as well. So please uh, visit there. This evening, our Sunday night service will uh, air uh, at 5 p.m. Be sure and tune in for our Sunday night sermon. Um, don't forget, guys, this is for you. Next Sunday, Mother's Day, um, it'll happen, and you'll forget, and you'll be sorry that you did. I'm still making up from last year, but I'm, I've, got it, I've got it tied around my finger, so I know it this year. But yeah, seriously speaking, uh, next Sunday is going to be a special day as we celebrate Mother's uh, and it's going to be a great day, and we uh, know that there'll be a lot of folks coming to celebrate with us. We invite you and your mom to come and celebrate with us. Uh, it'll be a great, great day. Also, we are celebrating our graduates this month. We have several of our 
uh, young men that are graduating from high school. Uh, you see them displayed on the board there. By the way, if you don't see them displayed on the board, if they're a graduate that we have somehow overlooked, please let us know. We, we, we don't want to overlook anyone, but these are the ones that we know about, and we want to celebrate them as they graduate uh, from high school. We'll be saying a little bit more about that on the 15th when we do something special uh, on that day. Please remember all of our brothers and sisters who have requested prayer. Our prayer list is available out in the foyer. It's also uh, on our church website. And there are a number of people, a number of our brothers and sisters who have requested prayer. Um, we are celebrating a prayer of thanksgiving this morning for uh, the brother-in-law of Sue and Peggy uh, Jones, Sue Gillenwater and Peggy Jones. Their brother-in-law, David Hickman, uh, is being baptized today. Uh, in Kentucky. And so we are celebrating, and we know that uh, this is a great momentous decision for David, and we're celebrating with Sue and Peggy in that time. And there are others that are going through times of difficulty and times of bereavement, and we want to remember them in prayer. So this morning, as Randy Allison prepares to uh, lead us in song, uh, before he comes, would you bow your head in prayer with me today? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we're truly thankful for all of the blessings that you send our way. Father, we are thankful for the changing seasons and um, the beautiful skies. Father, we're thankful that the terrible pandemic is, is not, not over, but things are getting better. And Father, we're just thankful that we can come together as brothers and sisters and worship uh, safely in spirit and in truth. And we pray that you would be with us today as we do so. Father, all that is said and all that is done, pray that it would renown to your glory and honor. And Father, in a body such as ours, we know that there are many who are going through times of difficulty. We just pray that you would give them uh, a restore, a reasonable portion of their health and strength. We pray for those that are bereaved, that you would give them comfort and peace as only you can. Be with each of us as we worship you today. Father, we pray that if we've done anything contrary to your word, that you'd forgive us, give us a home in heaven with you, for this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Randy? Good Sunday morning. I missed y'all last week. That old fatigue stuff from that little sickness I had kind of hit me last week. So I missed you. Kenny Henderson, thank you, buddy. Great job leading the singing. Good to see everybody here. Good faces everywhere. And I want y'all to meet my cousin. She's here. I'm going to embarrass her. But Charles and Charlene Fowler, y'all raise your hand, please. Look at them right there. See them? You know if she's my cousin, she's good, okay? I guarantee you. Honestly, she's a baker on the, my mother's side and from the Danville, Darnell area, and they moved here, Little Rock, and so uh, they're considering us. It won't take her long to find out this is going to be where it's at, but uh, just, it was, uh, all of us bakers worship together, but I'm glad to see her here. You know what? I was probably 10 years old or five or six the last time she saw me, so we really met each other today, so I hope you'll meet them uh, before we dismiss today, but the main part is not about us or other than Christ and Jesus. That's why we're here to worship today. Chuck's going to talk about building a life that matters. We'll have some songs like A Beautiful Life and Take My Life and Let It Be, and you'll notice those. So when you sing those, it's going to kind of tie in with his message and uh, make that uh, better, uh, help you a better Christian and strengthen your life. But the Caleb King Kingsley will lead our communion meditation. Brother David Wallace is going to have a scripture reading for us, and Brother Frederick Lewis will dismiss us. Let's stand and sing praises. To our Father in heaven. <clears throat> Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies through his beloved Son. Strong in the Lord. Jesus trust, who in the strength of Jesus trust is more than conqueror, stand in his great might, with all his strength in view, but take to arm you for the fight, but take to arm you for the fight, the path, the plea. Take every red 
please. <clears throat> Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the end of Today, as we take the bread that represents the body of Christ and the, the juice that represents the blood, let us remember that the cross has changed everything for us. Um, may we remember that the sacrifice, not only on the first day of the week, but on every day of our lives. Let's pray for the bread. Dear God, thank you for the sacrifice of your son. We recognize that without your sacrifice, we would be lost. Because of this, we can have hope for an eternity with you. Forgive us when we fall short. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Let's pray for the cup. Dear God, thank you for the blood that was shed on the cross. That was the sacrifice for all of our sins. May we never take this sacrifice for granted. Forgive us when we fall short and we strive to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. We have set aside this time to give back a portion of what God has um, blessed us with, so let's pray for the offering. Dear God, you have truly blessed us in more ways than we can know. May we give back with a cheerful heart at this time a portion of what you have given us. Help us to remember that everything that we have comes from you. In Jesus' name, amen. invite you to join now in a reading from the Word. Very familiar passage, the first Psalm of David, Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the pathway of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let's stand together. We sing this song before Chuck's message today. <coughs> bass has a bass lead, let's bear down. Each day I do a golden deed by helping all My life on earth is but a span, and so I do the best I can. Life's evening sun is sinking low, a few more days, and I must go to meet the deeds that I have done, where there will be no setting sun. Sing his praise while ages roll and strive to help some troubled soul. Thy evening sun is sinking low. A few more days and I must go to meet the deeds that I have done. Where there will be no setting sun. The only light that will endure is one that's kind and good and pure. And so for God, I'll take my stand. He say I live a helping hand. Life's evening sun is sinking low. A few more days and I must go. To meet the deeds that I have done, where there will be no setting sun, while going down life's weary road, I'll try to lay some traveler's load, I'll 
have tried to turn the night to day. May flowers bloom along the way. Thy feeling shot is sinking low. A few more days, and I must go to meet the deeds that I What a marvelous blessing it is to be in the presence of the Lord and the Lord's people. We're grateful that you're with us today. We say hello to uh, our burgeoning online congregation. There's so many that are joining us week after week after week. See, that's largely due to John's prodding. Have you noticed in John's announcements, he says basically the same thing in the same order every week. I was initially dubious about that. I said, John, you got to mix it up. He says, look, you don't know what you're talking about. He said, here's what you do. You tell them what you told them. You tell them, and then you remind them what you just told them. John, you're wearing us down, brother. It's working. There's a method to this man's madness. I tell you, there is. But we say hello to those online, our sister Darlene Mahone, Carolyn Basil Branch, Shannon Sanders, and a cast of hundreds, but we're grateful that all of you are here in person, whether you're here in person or online, what a blessing that is. I got to say something else. If, if you've never sat next to David Wallace during the service, it's like being in a chorus or something. David can sing bass, he can sing tenor, he can drop off on the lead, he doesn't bury the melody. I mean, David, I'm a better singer by just being around you. And I'm a better man by being around David's dog, Hagen. Susan and I were with David and Hagen at the Italian festival yesterday. It's Hagen's birthday today. She's 12. So Hagen is now older than David in dog years. So there's that. So that's good. Uh, Brother David read the first psalm just a minute ago. The first psalm is basically an Old Testament sermon on the blessedness of the life that is wholly committed to God and the folly of the life that rejects God. You cannot paint a starker contrast between two forms of life than the first psalm does. The only way, David says, that a person can hope to have lasting happiness is to be in fellowship with God. Let's pause on that for just a minute and reflect on the fact that that ought to get our attention. Because after all, how many times do you hear folks in the world, even folks in the church, God just wants me to be happy. God just wants me to be happy. Usually when someone says something like that, that's going to preface some really idiotic decision they're about to make. You know, um, I need more money. They got a bunch of money at the bank. Therefore, I should rob the bank, Jeff, because God wants me to be happy, and then I'll have a lot of money, and I'll be... No, that's not, that's not it. You're putting the cart before the horse. If you're interested in being happy, there's some of you that are. Listen to God. Follow him. That's really what this psalm is saying. There are two divergent paths contrasted in this psalm embodied in two different images. The first being a strong, healthy tree that can withstand any storm. The second being chaff that you can hold in your hand that a strong wind will blow away. The godly life is like that tree planted by streams of water. The wicked life, the worldly life, is like the chaff that will be blown away. God wants us to be like that tree. We can be persons of righteousness, persons of character, persons of integrity by accepting and following the wisdom of God. We can build lives that matter. The sad reality is that of the world's seven and a half billion inhabitants, 
a lot of these lives really don't matter. There'll be people that'll be here for a while. They'll go out and engage in all kinds of activities. Some are worthwhile, many are not, and they'll die. The grass will grow over their place and they'll be remembered no more. And yet, while there's an appointment that everyone has to one day shuffle off this mortal coil, the person that lives for God will leave a legacy that will be remembered for generation to generation to generation. Do you want to live a life that matters both here and in the hereafter? Listen to the words of the psalmist and walk in the counsel of God. Let's look at the three points that could be taken from this passage. We can live a blessed life by following God's strategy for successful living, first of all, by adopting a lifestyle which shuns. Yes, Skippy, the bad news is there are some things if you're going to live for God, you can't do. I wouldn't suggest that living the Christian life means thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that, thou shalt not do something else. Because mostly in Christ Jesus, it's not no, but it's yes. And yet, there are some no's in there. There are some things that you need to steer clear of, some things that you need to shun. The righteous man is first of all described negatively by what he doesn't do. He does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Are there some voices out there encouraging you to do this or this or that? Yeah. They telling you the truth? Well, it depends. Some are, some aren't. You better be able to recognize. You better be discerning. You better be able to distinguish right from wrong. A lot of people can't. And the psalmist here says the righteous man does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor does he stand in the seat of sinners, the way of sinners. He does not sit in the seat of mockers. What do these three have in common? None of them care one whit about what God says. No one cares what the Bible has to say about it. It's my opinion, my opinion, and my opinion. Well, not to insult you, nobody cares about your opinion. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. Let God be true and every man a liar. God will tell you the truth. People won't always tell you the truth. Sometimes people just say what you want to hear. I remember as a little kid, they would play. I didn't see the first run. I was too young for that. But I'd see the reruns on TV back in the day of Leave it to Beaver. And Wally and the Beave had a friend named Eddie Haskell. You remember Eddie? Always come over with flattery on his lips. You look lovely today, Mrs. Cleaver. You know, he was that little weasel. You went to school with this guy. He'd butter up the teachers and kiss up to the teachers, and behind their back, he was saying something different. A lot of folks in the world like that. That was actually pretty good training. You can't believe everybody, okay? As the Proverbs would say, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Just because somebody's saying something that you want to hear does not necessarily mean they're telling you the truth. So walking in the counsel of the wicked, standing in the way of sinners, sitting in the seat of mockers, there's no future in that. The psalmist knows that these three perils threaten human beings, and he is urging us to guard our direction, our leisure, and our company, if we're going to build lives that matter, we must refuse to do the things that the wicked person does. And there's simply a lot of competition out there. There's a lot of temptation. There's a cacophony of voices calling us, come over here, go over there. You can't do it. 
you know, I, I don't flatter myself in thinking that as soon as we get done preaching a sermon, that everybody's going to remember every part of it. I've kind of learned over the course of time, most of you aren't going to remember any of it. You know, just way of the world, that's the way it is. I still remember a sermon that I heard in Jackson, Michigan about 35 years ago. It was at an AA meeting, also an NA meeting, and whether you were an Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous, a friend of mine in the church there had a bad, bad drug problem, and he was working the program. And he said, Chuck, he said, I think if the church were more like these 12-step groups, I think that we could help more people. And I said, well, I've read some of that. He said, well, that's good, but you need to see it. I said, okay. He said, go with me to the, to the AA meeting this week. I said, done. So we went over there. It was in the basement of a church somewhere. I was like one of three people out of 40 that wasn't smoking. A lot of folks smoking back then. Now, that's kind of changed now. But we were in there, and they'd go around the, the room, and, you know, and, hi, you know, my name's Randy. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Randy. R Randy's not. I'm just using him as an example. But, but they were going around, and they were, you know, everybody had introduced themselves. And I was kind of thinking. I thought, well, they're going to get to me, and i got to say something. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I don't, I don't lie. So they got to me, and they're like, you know, I said, uh, hi, uh, my name's Chuck, and, um, and I'm really glad to be here. So uh, and they went on and they kind of went to the rest of the room. That wasn't the important part. The important part is what happened next. This big guy, I mean, probably 6'5", you know, 275, just chiseled muscle by the name of Big Al got up. He was big. He had a cowboy hat. He had like a Fu Manchu and like a beard and everything. I still remember the three points of his sermon. I couldn't remember most of the three points of the sermon I preached last week. I remember this. That's what he said. He looked at everybody like this. I say he was big. He was, he was big. He said, you want to change your life? Are you interested in changing your life? Everybody's like, yeah. You got to change three things. Your playgrounds your playmates, and your playthings. That's perfect. You're thinking, well, fool, why don't you preach that? And I could save 25 minutes and we can get to, the, get to the sizzler and eat lunch. That's a great sermon in three points. I, I knew what he meant. You know what he meant. Okay? You adopt a lifestyle that shuns. I'm not going to be in the wrong places. I'm not going to have as my closest associates the wrong people. And I'm not going to do the wrong things. Okay, if you're doing those things, you are headed for trouble. I don't care how pretty you are, how smart you are, how tough you are. You're not going to make it. You're in trouble. Stay away from those things. That's what the psalmist is saying. Same thing. You want to live a life that matters? Start by adopting a lifestyle which shuns certain sinful, destructive behaviors. Number two, you can live a successful life by adopting a lifestyle which seeks. There's a big problem with some Christians. All they can think about is, I don't do this. I don't do this. I don't. Well, that's good. We just told you there's some stuff you don't need to do. But what do you do? Do you do something? Remember the story Jesus tells in Luke about that? He says there was a, a house that had an evil spirit in it. The guy that owned the house decided, we're going to get rid of that evil spirit. So he swept the house clean and kicked the evil spirit out. But he didn't put anything in the house and it remained empty. And the spirit came back. And he brought seven of his pals with him. And the last state, wait for it, the last state of the man was worse than the first. He's not talking about house. He's talking about the house of the body, the person. Okay, that's what he's talking about. The problem in that case, Jesus says, is they got rid of the bad stuff, 
but they didn't replace it with any good stuff. Nature abhors a vacuum. That's just a fancy way of saying that an empty space is not going to remain empty for very long. Go see a field that's cleared, and then they don't put anything in it. Six months later, there's trees and vine. That's the way it is. It's the way it is with us. You know, someone says, well, I'm going to stop drinking. Oh, good, you should. I'm going to stop taking drugs. Absolutely. I'm going to stop cheating on my taxes. We just passed April 18th, so that's good. I'm going to stop rooting for the Ohio State Buckeyes. You shouldn't, okay? There are some things you just should not do. So hallelujah, stop doing that. But here's the thing. If you don't fill the bad stuff, that, that empty space that used to be contained with the bad stuff, with good stuff, it's not going to make it. Listen to what the psalmist says. The righteous man now is described positively by what he seeks. Verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Gordon Dahl makes a really interesting observation. He says, most middle-class Americans, that's most of us probably, tend to worship their work, to work at their play, and to play at their worship. Yikes. Obviously, this guy knows some people. That's, tell me that's not accurate. That's generally what we do. Well, we probably ought to reverse some of the order there. We can build lives that matter when we build them around seeking the will of God. Not everything else. God has to be first. Marshall Keeble said this, Jesus has given the gospel as a signpost directing the way. If you've got the signpost, you've got the light of the gospel. No need running around in the dark. When you find the signpost, you don't get down and pray. You follow the sign. That's it. When you see what it is God's saying, do it. What does James say? Blessed is the man who hears the word of God and does the will of God. A lot of people hear. James said, if you hear the word of God and don't do it, you're like a person that sees his reflection in the mirror and you got dirt and grease and oil all over your face and you're like, yeah, that looks good. And you walk away and don't do anything. Clean it up. That's what he's saying. A fellow by the name of Charles Pugh wrote something I was keenly interested in. He said he remembered going into his medical doctor's office and, you know, those places are usually kind of cold and clinical, and maybe they got a skeleton or the outline of the body or something. You know, I, every time I go in there, I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. It's good. This one had a sign. He said he'd never forgotten it 50 years ago. I don't know if you do that today, but they did then. He said, this is what the sign said. In your search for answers to guide your life, check out the yellowed pages of God's word. I love that. I absolutely love that. I remember one of the things that told me that Arkansas was going to be different from the places I lived before. First week I moved here. I still remember the first person I visited uh, at the church in the hospital, Frank Lemon. I love Frank to this day. I miss him dearly. He died several years ago. Frank wasn't in good health 21 years ago when I moved here, and he was the first person I saw at the hospital. I went to St. Vincent, and Frank was going to have an operation, like in an hour. Frank didn't know me from Adam, and you, I mean, Frank and I would become good friends. At that moment, Frank didn't care who I was. It's like, who's this guy? You know, I don't know this guy. And Frank was anxious, and you could tell he was nervous. That lasted until his doctor walked in the room guy by the name of Dale Morris. Some of you might know him. Good, good man. Dale walked in and did something I'd never seen in my life. Before the surgery and they carted Frank off, he led us in a prayer. I remember thinking, what kind of place is this where the doctor is praying? I lived in a place in Michigan. The doctor thought he was God. 
not here. This doctor was leaning on God. I thought, what a marvelous thing that is. Here's the thing. A lifestyle that seeks the will of God is going to be successful. I don't care if you're a doctor or you're picking up trash. It doesn't matter. The person that puts God first will succeed. The person who ignores God will fail. That's what the psalmist is trying to tell us. And if you need further confirmation, look at the third point. You can live the life that matters. You can build that life that matters by adopting a lifestyle which succeeds, which wins, which flourishes. The righteous man is consequently described here by his success. Look at verse 3. He is like a tree that is planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Wait for it. Whatever he or she does prospers. God will bless you. God will help you. Draw near to God, James says, and he will draw near to you. It's as simple as that. The life of the righteous is characterized by permanence, by productivity, by prosperity, with God's hand of blessing upon him as he strives to make his life count. You know what's going on in the world right now? There's someone who's doing his level best to put God to the test on this very point. His name is Vladimir Putin. He's one of the world's richest people. He's one of the world's most powerful people. He sits on 43% of the world's nuclear arsenal. That's why no one's taken him out so far. He didn't have those nukes. Somebody would have hit him in the head with the tire iron a couple of months ago. But they're afraid of the man. And it looks, for all practical purposes, like he's going to win. He's winning right now. Well, kind of. He's in a stalemate with the Ukrainians. You know, 40 years ago, another Russian by the name of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he basically predicted somebody like Putin doing what he was doing. Putin then was, you know, coming up in the KGB. But this is what Solzhenitsyn said in a speech this month in 1983. He said, societies are losing more and more of their religious essence as they thoughtlessly yield up the younger generations to atheism. You, you think that hasn't basically built this that we're seeing right now, that it hasn't influenced it? The Soviet Union was an atheistic empire. There's no God. If there's no God, as the other Russian Dostoevsky said, then everything is permissible. And Putin says, I got the army. I'll take what I want. You don't like it? What are you going to do? And that's what he's doing. Solzhenitsyn went on to say this, that this abandoning of God among the young was sowing seeds of hatred, whatever its basis may be, race, class, ideology. Are you seeing that over there? Yeah, you are. And he concluded by this, saying this, such hatred is corroding many hearts today. Atheistic teachers are bringing up a generation in the spirit of hatred of their own society. That is chilling. Because even the Russians that are doing this man's bidding, that are doing his fighting, they don't respect him. They don't like him. They're afraid of him. I talked to a Russian a couple of months ago that lives here in Little Rock. You know what she said? She said, the people of Russia are not for this. But one man is pushing it and getting his way so far. So far. My friend, there's a reckoning coming. Do you understand that? There are all kinds of people in the world getting away with all kinds of things temporarily. But God is watching, and God will do something. You can bet on that. You see, true prosperity is not about having the most money. It's not about having the biggest army. It's not about having a nuclear arsenal. 
True prosperity is not the same thing as material prosperity. When a person lives the way this psalm instructs, he will know an individual prosperity in his personal stability, in his productivity, in his vitality, and his spirituality. Success that will always elude the person who pursues the worthlessness of the wicked life. You know what our problem is in the West? Thankfully, it's not somebody like Putin that's throwing us into some stupid, pointless war. Our problem is we have bought into the notion that the one who dies with the most toys wins. We say we don't, but our actions betray us. Remember a couple of years ago, 2020, COVID was just out of control. Churches were shutting down. Nobody could go anywhere. You know, we're waiting for a vaccination and everybody is sheltering in place and you couldn't go anywhere. I, I've never in my life with my wife made so many homemade pizzas ever. We made homemade pizza all the time. I thought, well, why haven't we been doing this all the year? Because we would go buy the pizza, but you can't go anywhere. You can't go to church, you can't go to work, you can't go here, you can't go there. Uh, after a couple of months of that, Bill and I, we hadn't visited anybody in like three months. And Bill said, what do you think? I said, I'm sick of staying at home. Let's go somewhere. So we went and visited folks. I bet of the first five people we went to, four of them were behind locked doors looking at us like we were vampires. Those were some of you. So uh, yeah, that was that. But you remember how it was. It was bad. You know, you couldn't go anywhere. You couldn't do anything. Then on social media, it was Instagram, David Geffen puts a picture of his boat on there. Do we got a picture of that, I think? Well, we should have had a picture of it. I'll tell you what it looked like. It was a 454-foot yacht. Not a boat. It's a yacht. Yeah? $400 million. He had a picture of it on there, and this is what he put. You, you can't make this up. Hope everybody is staying safe. <laughs> I don't encourage it, but I'm saying when the poor rise up and kill the rich, this is going to be why, probably. These folks are losing their businesses. They're losing their jobs. They can't pay their rent. They're looking for money. And hope everyone is staying safe like I am on this boat. And I'm like, oi, Faye, dude, some sensitivity. You remember in the days prefacing the French Revolution, the peasants of Paris and France were starving. They had no bread to eat. Bread was the staple of their diet. And it was brought up to one of the royals, Marie Antoinette. But they have no bread. She said, they have no bread. Let them eat cake. You remember how that ended for her? Not well. Okay, here's the point. I don't think that everybody's going to visit the guillotine who's just you know, selfish and doesn't care for their fellow man. But here's the thing. Again, if God's watching someone like Putin and the things he's doing, God's watching those of us that live a really comfortable life and we're selfish and don't want to give and help each other out. God's watching that too. So if you want to build a life that matters, there are some things that you need to shun. Don't do them. There are some things that you need to seek. Do them. And when you put your priorities and your actions in the right place, God will make sure that you succeed. Was I kidding? <laughs> hope everyone's staying safe. I hope your boat sinks, okay? <laughs> Can I say that with a Christ-like spirit? Good grief. You know, take some people that don't have a place to live, David, and put them on your boat. Here's the message that God would have for us as we close. Okay? There's two paths in life. Nobody really wants to get to this. They don't. Because we have been told there are many paths to God. No, there aren't. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. In case you think maybe he was confused when he said that, in Matthew 7, 
He said, there are two roads. There's a broad road, easy to find, easy to walk, but it leads to destruction. There's a narrow road, hard to find, difficult to walk, but it leads to life. My friend, while there's yet time, choose wisely. Your future, your eternity depends on it. The invitation of Jesus is calling to you. We invite you to respond as we stand, as we sing. Pure and Lord, oh God, me to be. May Son, Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here. Let's all leave here today and build a life that matters while we hold to God's unchanging hand. Time is filled with swift transition. No other weapon who can stand in your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand, oh, to God's unchanging hand, oh, to God's 
and changing hand Feel your hopes on things eternal Hope to God's unchanging hand When your journey is completed If to God you have been free and bright the home in glory your enraptured soul will view oh to God's unchanging hand oh to God's unchanging hand build your hopes on things eternal oh to God's unchanging hand God bless you have a great day